Deutsche Bank, the fiat money world may be coming to an end. Deutsche Bank strategist Jim Reed suspects that global demographics and other realities may be soon putting the current fiat money regime to the test. According to Business Insider, Reed's basic contention is this, the dominance of the fiat currency system since Richard Nixon decoupled gold from the dollar in 1971 is inherently unstable and prone to high inflation, and an offsetting disinflationary shock that kept it afloat since 1980 is now slowly reversing. If that's the case, Reed says the fiat currency system a term which describes any currency whose value is backed by the government that issued it, rather than by a commodity like gold or silver could be seriously tested over the next decade. But why now? According to Reed, since the 1970s, many world economies have benefited significantly from a number of deflationary forces. Chief in Reed's mind is an explosion in the global working age population which has led to declines in wages and an ability to produce immense amounts of goods and services at low prices. Other deflationary forces, which aren't mentioned in the buy piece, include the technological gains that Alan Greenspan was always so fond on mentioning when he spoke publicly. It's true that labor has increased, but so has the usefulness of capital in making less expensive goods. Reed terms the large growth in the global labor force as a demographic super cycle and that any reversal in the cycle could spell problems for the fiat currency system. The reason? Well, thanks to these deflationary forces, central banks can respond with familiar tools, more leverage, loose policy and extensive money printing. Thanks to so many factors that are pushing prices downward, Central banks can massively expand the money supply and still maintain some semblance of price stability. Buried in this explanation, of course, is what Austrians have long pointed out about prices, in a modern economy, the natural thing for prices to do is go down. Contrary to the deflation phobia exhibited by so many economists today, falling prices are a signal of improvements in capital, and possibly of greater access to capital by workers. Neither of these things are a danger to an economy. Thus, as Reed notes, without so much central bank money printing, global prices would likely have been declining for the past two or three decades, just as they did during much of the late 19th century in the US when living standards were increasing substantially. So, while central bank money printers think everything's fine because their price indices show low inflation, it is likely that the real cost of money printing has been a beneficial lack of deflation. In other words, consumers could have benefited from repeated drops in the cost of living in recent decades. But instead, they get mild inflation which robs them of the cheaper goods that would have existed in the absence of central bank meddling. Fortunately for central banks, though, few voters and consumers view things that way, and instead have bought the idea that prices are naturally flat, and thus, an inflation rate of, say, 2% is no big deal. In reality, voters and consumers should be comparing an inflation rate of 2%, not to 0% but to, say, negative 2%. In this scenario, central bank inflation should be viewed not as 2%, but as 4%. Every year. Compounding. Reed is now worried that these deflationary factors may be coming to an end and once it does, central banks won't be able to use their usual tricks. And if that happens, the age of fiat money will be in trouble. Will Deutsche Bank collapse the global market? The past year has seen its fair share of worries. From the China slowdown to the Brexit, successive waves of overseas fear have rolled onto our shores since 2015, yet none of them were the tsunamis the bears had predicted. The latest foreign fear concerns the possibility for a global credit crisis led by the collapse of a major international bank. A simplified summary of this scenario goes something like this, Deutsche Bank is on the brink of bankruptcy and its insolvency could spark a systemic European banking crash. This in its turn could send shockwaves throughout the global financial system, resulting in widespread economic turmoil on PAR with the previous worldwide crisis. Commentators who favor this outlook tend to illustrate their dire predictions with a graph of Deutsche Bank's stock performance since last year. It certainly adds a spark of credence to their argument based solely on the depth of the stock's plunge. 
One commentator has gone so far as to assert that if Deutsche Bank goes under it will be Lehman times 5. Other observers have expressed a similar concern, albeit in less alarmist terms. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, labeled Deutsche Bank as the most risky financial institution. The argument goes that since Deutsche Bank is linked with other publicly traded banks and insurance companies, it has the potential to be the source of another worldwide financial contagion should the bank collapse. In 2009, Deutsche Bank CEO Joseph Ackermann assured investors that it had enough money to survive a crisis. Three years later, however, some of his colleagues said bank had 12 billion euros of operating losses with derivatives. The first warnings that Deutsche Bank could declare bankruptcy emerged in 2013 when the bank said it needed additional capital, according to SputnikNews.com. In 2013, it attracted $3 billion through issuing shares for its stakeholders. In March 2015, a stress test revealed that the bank again needed additional capital. It was also revealed that the bank manipulated with LIBOR, and in April 2015 it was fined for $2.5 billion. Subsequently, the ratings agency Standard & Poor's downgraded Deutsche Bank from A to BBB+, three positions above the junk rating. In early June 2016, Deutsche Bank was again involved in a scandal over LIBOR manipulation. The case involved at least 29 personnel who worked in London, Frankfurt, Tokyo, and New York. Last year, Deutsche Bank reported a net loss of 6.8 billion euros for the first time since 2008. Most recently, the bank made headlines last week when its Exetra Gold Exchange traded bond failed to deliver gold upon clients' request. This understandably sparked grave concern from many in the financial realm that Deutsche Bank's back is against the ropes once again. Could a Deutsche Bank collapse serve as the catalyst for a 2008-type global credit storm? When analyzing this question one must be very careful from making dogmatic statements since no one, especially an outsider to the international banking industry, can possibly know all the variables involved. There are, however, some guidelines that can help us understand the position of the broad market vis-a-vis -vis the effects of an ailing global institution. These guidelines should allow us to at least handicap the odds of a global financial meltdown. One important guideline is the underlying strength and internal health of the financial market, notably the U.S. equity market. In the months prior to the 2008 credit crash the U.S. stock market was exceedingly weak as evidenced by the sustained decline in NICE internal momentum. In fact, this is what the longer-term internal momentum indicator for the NICE broad market looked like just prior to the 2008 collapse. This internal weakness, combined with growing institutional weakness in almost all major sectors of the economy, meant that the U.S. was highly vulnerable to a financial shock. When the Lehman Brothers collapse hit the market, the shockwaves were felt immediately and resulted in a domino effect. In other words, internal weakness makes it far more likely that an exogenous shock to the system will prove devastating, if not fatal. By contrast, an internally strong internal condition makes it far less likely that an exogenous event, such as the collapse of a giant bank, would derail the U.S. financial system. Consider the experience of 1998 when the combination of the Asian currency crisis, the LTCM meltdown, and the near collapse of the commodity market hit the U.S. stock market. U.S. equities were in a raging bull market at that time and the financial market was internally strong. The contagion hit our shores in the summer of 98, and while it did briefly plunge the Dow and S&P into a malaise within three months the major indices were off to the races again and finished out the year at new all-time highs. The U.S. essentially shrugged off what would normally have been a catastrophic event due to its internal strength. I would argue that the U.S. financial market finds itself in a similar situation today. Instead of chronic weakness, the U.S. market is internally quite strong. Witness the longer-term NICE internal momentum indicator below. As you can see, it's in stunning contrast to the 2008 scenario shown above. The late great historian and author Barbara Tuckman said it best when she wrote, Social systems can survive a good deal of folly when circumstances are historically favorable, 
or when bungling is cushioned by large resources or absorbed by sheer size as in the United States during its period of expansion, W. Hen there are no more cushions, folly is less affordable. The cushions she mentions are in place and are in the form of the rising intermediate term and longer term internal momentum previously mentioned. If a Deutsche Bank collapse happens in the coming months a mere conjecture to be sure it would be very unlikely to collapse the US given the prevailing internal strength. Mastering moving averages The moving average is one of the most versatile of all trading tools and should be a part of every investor's arsenal. The moving average is one of the most versatile of all trading tools and should be a part of every investor's arsenal. Far more than a simple trend line. It's a dynamic momentum indicator as well as a means of identifying support and resistance across variable time frames. It can also be used in place of an overbought slash oversold oscillator when used in relationship to the price of the stock or ETF you are trading in. In my latest book, Mastering Moving Averages, I remove the mystique behind stock and ETF trading and reveal a completely simple and reliable system that allows retail traders to profit from both up and down moves in the market. The trading techniques discussed in the book have been carefully calibrated to match today's fast-moving and sometimes volatile market environment. If you're interested in moving average trading techniques, you'll want to read this book.